Sup fuckers, cool kid here. I've decided that weird and obscure stuff may be too complicated for some players, so I decided that in the name of accessibility, I'm going to do things that are more obvious and mundane. I shouldn't have to explain further unless your IQ is room temperature, so spoiler warning like always, and without further ado, let's rock. Nyx is actually a female variant of Excalibur, from a time when all frames were going to have opposite sex counterparts. It's possible to recreate a frame's default palette using the Tenno series of colors, which is stupid and a huge waste of time, but doable. Warframe released on March 25th, 2013, however several Warframes have a release date listed before that date. This is possible due to Eternalism. Speaking of dates, January 1st, 2035 appears to be a placeholder date for permanent bans, but I myself am a firm believer that this heralds the return of Noob Shotek, who will finally teach us how to max a Warframe's level in negative amounts of time. When an enemy's HP reaches zero, they die. This can be most easily achieved by damaging them. This also applies to the player, where if your health reaches zero, you die. Casting abilities reduces energy, but when your energy hits zero, you don't die, so maybe the number zero is unrelated to dying? I'm not really sure to be honest. How can an enemy's shield bleed? Why does armor stop poison? Shouldn't these be reversed? By pressing crouch and jumping at the same time, you can do what's called a bullet jump, which is a niche tech useful for getting around. In addition, you can also sprint by pressing the shift key, which makes you run faster. Why don't we just always run? Are we stupid? Ember is the fire-themed Warframe. Most weapons need to be reloaded, but strangely, melees don't. You can slide up stairways, which somehow doesn't break your legs. Darvo is canonically Frodebeck's son, as was revealed in the Ties That Bind Tactical Alert. The wiki says that during this event it was also revealed that Frodebeck was grooming Darvo for a position on the Corpus board, which means that Beck is canonically a Discord moderator. Trinity is a character that exists. Every mission is secretly just exterminate, it just varies what you're exterminating and why. Go ahead, argue with me in the comments, I'll make plenty of shit up. In Warframe, you play as a Warframe. Our history is smoke, blurred by dreams, guided by ghosts. A voice, a voice. Why did Alad V make a deal with the sentience? Is he stupid? If you go to the Lavarian and give Drusus all your credits, you'll have no more credits. Wait a second, Frost and Nyx weren't in the original eight Warframes? What the fuck? Ortis isn't voiced by Patrick Warburton. Despite being named the Lotus, she's actually not a flower, but rather a person. Please stop letting Megan play the game on stream, her fashion makes me feel ill. The official term for a Warframe player is a registered loser. Be sure to send Forma bundles to Blueprint 27. Gauss and Grendel are actually canonically married. Evidence? I made it up. Caliban is also a character that exists. I am a registered Lex offender. Many characters are based on classic literature or mythology, like Loki, Caliban, Kullervo, and many others. If this has any lore relation beyond just the name, then Loki has canonically been impregnated by a horse. I miss Super Jump DE, please bring it back. Garuda still has no actual lore. Can the queens please stop sending me little meat Kuva liches? They make me feel really uncomfortable. Please let me have Fortuna back, I miss the bisexual lighting. The comment section on the Warframe wiki is a known carcinogen. A magus. We need to bring back racism. They put me below Sab in the YouTube tier list? I'm fucking ruined! I hate our Warframe. I hate our Warframe. I hate our Warframe! What the fuck is a Zababa? I should eat my car keys. But in truth, we were both imprisoned in Lua's belly. In water, chimps will drown. Wait, the Arc Thrower crashes the game now? I'm... Th th this time I'm really gonna do it. Did they remove Rotjaw? Seriously, I haven't seen her in ages, where the fuck is she? Yes, I'm actually dating Nitro, it isn't a bit. It's not a dog. It's not a fucking dog. It's a caracal. Look at the ears. Why is it so hard? I'm not a fucking furry. Wait, Metroid is a girl? Holy shit, they made the Margua 5'6"? Are you using charge on Raider? T take that shit off. Can we please get the option to pet Snappy? I want to congratulate him for the one kill he gets per stage. Smasher Pass, Bread Bowl of Cheese Soup. I'm not making a Chevenant video. There will never be a Chevenant video. There is no Chevenant video. Hey everyone, Cool Kid here, and I am at my fucking limit. You know what? Fuck it. I need to take a break. S somebody else take over. I'm gonna go grab some Argazine. Let me draw the heat. Just deliver that package. Oh, my first <laughs> Howdy, gamers. On April 1st, 2010, Bungie released a promotional video for Halo Reach showing off a chess game mode. 
And uh, to everyone's surprise, when the game came out, it turned out to be real. And surprisingly enough, it actually still works in MCC if you want to give it a try. Just uh, look up this gamer tag and download the map and mode from their file share. Halo C has a surprising number of unintended tricks, kind of like its younger brother Halo 2. One of the more useful and easy ones being the backpack reload. To do this, all you have to do is press the reload button twice and then switch weapons. Now, the weapon that's holstered on your back will reload while you're using your secondary. If you watch the opening cutscene from the mission Gravemind in Halo 2, on Legendary, you can see a cutout of Bungie developer Jason Jones off to the side right here. But if you do watch the same cutscene in Anniversary Graphics, on Legendary, again, you'll instead see X343 dev Frank O'Connor in his beamish outfit from Ford Unto Dawn. In Halo 3, ODST, some of the ODST helmets have the texture of a face on the visor. It's really hard to see because it's super low opacity, but tr trust me, it's there. No, I, I swear. And I have yet to find any mention of this online, which just makes it a lot more terrifying for me, honestly. Like, I, I feel like I'm a fucking schizoid or something. In the last mission of Halo 3, right after 343 Guilty Spark betrays you, uh, again, spoiler alert, <laughs> if you had placed turrets in the previous section, after you kill Guilty Spark, they'll actually turn hostile to you once you go back. And they make his sentinel beam look like a super soaker. If you beat the Halo 4 campaign on Legendary difficulty, you get a super secret ending. This secret ending is actually a reference to the Halo TV show. In Halo 5's Forge mode, there's a plush pig named Olive that's actually based off of Tom French's real pet pig, also named Olive. For those who are not aware, Tom French was the Forge lead on Halo 5 and later the creative multiplayer lead for Infinite. Also, Olive can make pig noises. One of the voice actors for Halo Infinite was actually a pug named Gyoza. I, I'm really sorry, I don't know how to pronounce this name. He's attributed to voicing some random aliens and creature sounds in the game, and he even has his own IMDB page. I actually showed this to my own dog, Molly, hoping she would finally get a fucking job, but as expected, uh, she's still not paying bills. In 1-4, Flare the Loon, the player is tasked with finding three blue skulls to open the door to the V2 boss fight. However, you can bring one of the skulls to this headless skeleton. Doing so causes a text box to appear saying that you decide to name the skeleton Hank. Doing the same to this skeleton in Ship of Fools will cause another text box to appear, this time naming the skeleton Hank Jr. If you set the weapon position to middle and the HUD type to classic, the jump sound changes to the one from Quake. In 1-3 and 4-3, you can find a bar of soap. It does a million damage to anything it hits, instantly killing it. This is a reference to Dusk, another new blood pilot who started the trend of the soap being the most powerful weapon in its game. There are several unique and obscure style moments in the game. By dropping enemies into the various pools of blood in P-2, you get the Skrongled, Skrongbongled, and Skringdongu loaded style bones. Dropping enemies into the depths of the starting area of 5-4, you get a style bonus called Why Are You Spawning Enemies Here? As no enemies naturally spawn in this level other than the boss. Speaking of 5-4, the Leviathan boss has a weird attack property on his lunge. Despite being a blue flash attack, which are typically unparryable, this attack can be parried. Originally in development, it was going to have a yellow flash to communicate this, but the timing is very tight and unreasonably difficult, so the flash was swapped to blue while keeping the attack mechanically the same. Still on the topic of the Wrath Lair, lightning can be seen in the background of the levels 5-2 and 5-4. While the lightning will never strike the enemies or the player naturally, certain metal projectiles can redirect the lightning strikes into them. These include nails, the magnet from the attractor nail gun, and the screw from the screwdriver rail cannon. Inside one of the chimneys of the Titanic in 5-2, a nest can be found containing a hamster known as Florp, who can be picked up like a skull. Bringing him back to the start of the level and scaling the large tower reveals a pedestal to place him on, as well as Jakito, an evil being who is freed once Florp is sacrificed. 
Jakito will then enter the skybox and cause the screen to grow progressively more white until he crashes the game. The XPR-50's bullets appear to be using a placeholder white texture instead of a regular one. In the map Shangri-La, you can find this dead zombie with an MG42 LMG right next to the random perk location by the tunnel. What is weird is that the zombie uses a model from the giant rather than using any of the zombie models found in Shangri-La. On the rise of Draka and Zetsubu no Shima, by using the console commands you can access a weapon that was cut from the final game, the M27. It appears to reuse the model and animations from Black Ops 2 while having a new set of textures and reusing its sounds from the ICR-1. Similarly, the Wonder Wolf DG-2 can be obtained in Shadows of Evil via console commands, with the weapon working as expected though regular zombies but having no effect on the Margwa. Also on Shadows of Evil, you can find a VMP wall by that is clipping through a wall near the random perk location in the waterfront district. If the M14 is completely empty, the bolt of the weapon will slide back. Weird part is, the bolt will go back and forth between its normal and empty positions whenever you slide. When upgraded, the VMP visually receives the extended magazine attachment while its magazine size stays the same as the base version. Near the shortcut to the lower Lithic surrogate, there is a secret room that contains cave paintings of various other games such as Hollow Knight, Dark Souls and Dead Cells. Now, I don't know how these worlds manage to interact with each other, but if they ever get involved with our clan in any way, like, they will straight up just be fucked. There's no argument here, they will just immediately die. Leaving the hammer up in the single action army and landing hard can cause the gun to fire. Glass generates with random HP. This dictates how hard it is to break. Running, jumping, and then shoulder checking do more damage to the glass. Bolts can bounce, and playing on Halloween spawns pumpkins to shoot for extra ammo. Almost, if not every single part of guns and channels are fully modeled and function properly even if you can't see them. The more bullets in a magazine, the longer it takes to insert another bullet due to the increasing tension of the mag spring, which increases its resistance and makes it slower to load. The Smith & Wesson 510 is the only gun with a hammer unable to be half cocked. Half cocking can allow you to spin the cylinder on a revolver. Tapping the mouse button will slowly pull the hammer back on double actions allowing you to spin the cylinder. Drop your magazine but still want to shoot? Well fairly not. You can single load bullets into your guns. Revolver casings can sometimes expand and get stuck. Holding well, interact while dumping some rounds will instantly pick him back up. Falling glass hurts. If you ring it enough, he will come. For fans of Receiver 1, there's a functional cabinet in the compound somewhere you can reach through a vent. Where it is, uh, find it yourself. Billiards is functional. Lights can be turned off or destroyed by either turning off the switch manually, shooting the light or shooting the switch itself. You can shoot tapes to collect them without having to listen to them. Pressing the credits option in the main menu will load you into a special museum level. This level has plushies of everyone who contributed to the game, as well as short books they wrote about their involvement. The interesting thing, however, are these trash cans that are scattered throughout the level. Throwing a plushie to a trash can will burn it, and destroying 29 plushies will cause the lighting to darken and a fog to appear before a swarm of Gianni PNGs spawn and attack the player. These are statistically identical to Radiant Filth enemies, and killing them all restores the level's normal lighting and music. If you use the noclip cheat to enter secret levels that are still in development, a large chibi of Akita will be waiting for you inside, along with the text, you're not supposed to be here. In 6-1, Cry for the Weeper, the player can backtrack up this large drop from the outside. Landing on top of the spire reveals that atop it lies Armboy, with a text announcing such alongside clapping. He can also be found on a ledge in the aforementioned developer museum, functioning the same but not spinning. Outside the level's regular path in 4-2, a dead stalker can be found against the wall next to a sandcastle. Shooting the sandcastle causes a nuclear explosion, killing the player instantly. Also in 4-2, the Eiffel Tower and Statue of Liberty props have small versions of themselves as the texture of their tips. To start with a fairly well-known one, you can skip pillars on Captain by using Diablo Strike, and as long as you're at or above 90% of your maximum health, one-shot protection will kick in and you won't die, allowing you to float all the way up to Mithrix's room because of the reduced gravity on the moon. Unlike other health regeneration effects, the Lunar Heretic's degeneration is accelerated by the Spinal Tonic equipment rather than reversed and can kill you very quickly if you're not careful. The Artifact of Frailty is appropriately titled Weak-Ass Knees in the game's text files. 
Although exceptionally rare, especially when not in a simulated environment, you can use the Forgive Me Please equipment to spawn Lunar Coins. This can be taken one step further by using the equipment to spawn Lunar Coins on the plates on abandoned aqueducts, allowing you to open the doors to the elemental bands. I'm not getting footage of that, fuck off. After unlocking Hod's final upgrade, which gives all new agents plus two levels to all of their stats, you can lower the stats during the initial customization for no extra cost. Despite Crumbling Armor having no associated ego gift in its encyclopedia page, the effect it gives to employees is in the form of a hat ego gift, which means you could get rid of the stat changes by overriding it with any other hat. However, the penalty for attachment work won't go away until you end the workday. If an agent wearing the Firebird's Feather of Honor suit enters the Snow Queen's containment unit, they will immediately burn to death. Speaking of the Firebird, despite the encyclopedia page stating that there is no associate ego weapon, you are able to acquire its weapon by successfully suppressing it during a workday. You can only obtain its weapon once per day, and you can only have up to three copies of it. You cannot use support bullets on agents in containment units, and any shield an employee has breaks upon starting a work process. If the wolf is suppressed by Little Red with an employee in its stomach, the trapped employee will be freed and gain a secret ego gift. I wasn't able to get it for some reason, so I'm just going to put what it's supposed to look like on the screen right now. Also, something I found out trying to record all this, apparently the wolf could also just straight up ignore the lockdown that happens when you use the rabbit protocol. I don't know why the fuck it could do that. You can refresh a solid fuel thruster by repackaging and then unpackaging it. Normally, solar panels won't supply power unless the sun is out. Go figure. However, it's possible to make a perpetual power source by placing solar panels upside down on a platform above a gateway engine. Winches are a well-known source of weird physics in Astroneer, but by using a very specific setup of three winches, a rover seat, three packagers, and some well-timed circuitry, you can launch yourself into the stratosphere. Most galastropods, also known as snails, do not provide stacking effects, with two exceptions. Rogel provides six units of power for each connected to a platform or backpack. More interestingly though, is in Noki, who provides a movement and jump increase for each one on the player's backpack or terrain tool. This buff stacks up to 13 times, at which point you run out of space and can't stack it anymore. This isn't practical, but be prepared to suffer the consequences of your actions. In 7-1 Garden of Forking Paths, the Minotaur boss's name always appears with a strike through. This is a reference to the book House of Leaves, where all mentions of a creature known as the Minotaur are similarly crossed out. In the very next level, 7-2, you can enter this clock tower before it is bombed and falls over. Doing so and climbing to the top reveals a sleeping filth, who strangely enough uses the same font as Sans from Undertale when he falls asleep in his boss fight. This filth is very EP, and he just needs a quick honk shoe. In 7-4, during the Earthmover Brain boss fight, you can no-clip inside the brain itself to see it's being piloted by a dog. It plays a little tune made of dog marks, along with a control panel showing the text Gorblight ON. Funnily enough, when the boss is killed, this text briefly changes to Gorblight OFF. The Earthmover in the distance is piloted by another dog, but it takes over 10 minutes to fly all the way to it. Contrary to popular belief, Cool Kid is not better than me at the game. Any heretic claiming otherwise will be swiftly executed. The god cards are known as cards that are not very good in Yu-Gi-Oh! Despite getting a lot of support in recent years, due to the fact that they don't share a name like many other archetypes, they tend to lack cohesion. Despite this, Ra is, albeit tangentially, related to a completely separate archetype unrelated to the god cards. Due to its support card Blaze Cannon containing the word Blaze Accelerator in its Japanese name, it is related to the, well, Blaze Accelerator archetype, which is a support archetype for the volcanic monster archetype. It's not the only card like this, but it's a really interesting one considering how iconic the god cards are. Speaking of god cards, 
cards, Cypher the Sky Dragon is the only god card to have its name changed when translated to English. It's also the only one in English not named after an Egyptian god. I said it's named after an executive producer at 4Kids, whose name was Roger Slifer. This led to one of my favorite jokes in Yu-Gi-Oh! The Abridged series, where they refer to Cypher the Sky Dragon as Slifer, the executive producer. Egyptian what now? Oh right, I completely forgot I had that. Come forth, Slifer, the executive producer! Headed Behemoth was a card put on the ban list for an interesting reason. Rather than being part of a broken combo or potential OTK, it was instead put on there because it was a ruling nightmare. The card has a soft once per duel effect, meaning each copy can activate its effect once per duel, that effect being to summon itself from the graveyard. On its own, this isn't broken, but with many cards that shuffle cards from anywhere into the deck, it could become impossible to keep track of which copy had already used the effect. So it was limited to one until it received an errata, making it so it was a hard once per duel, meaning you can only use the effect once, period. Most Yugi cards end with multiples of 100 in their attack and defense values, but some cards, especially older cards, have multiples of 10. Examples being Sword Arm of Dragon, King of Yami Makai, Dark Chimera, and Reaper of the Cards. But there's a more modern card that has this too, being number S39 Utopia Prime, who not only had 2510 attack, and more than the normal Utopia, but had an effect that brings you down to exactly 10 life points. One of the few ways to get your life points that low without effects that directly half them. While Yugi has never done crossovers in the same way that Magic the Gathering has, it has had cards reference other media. A notable example being Cosmos, an archetype that is a cross between The Wizard of Oz and Star Wars. And Another example being Tyler the Great Warrior, referencing Goku three years before the Dragon Ball card game launched in 2008, but it also references a lot of Konami products. The Vampire Archetype is a bunch of cards that reference Castlevania, none being more prominent than Vampire Hunter, who wields a whip like the Belmonts, as well as some one-off references such as Tactical Espionage Expert being a not-so-subtle reference to Solid Snake. Back in the 5Ds era, there was a strange cheating strategy where people would cheat by laying monster cards in their spell trap zones, particularly with the Infernity Archetype, an archetype with monsters that gain extra effects when you have no cards in your hand. If players had monster cards they couldn't get rid of, they would lay them in the spell and trap zones just so they could get the Infernity the effects off, and if for some reason those cards would have to be revealed to the opponent, such as they were being destroyed, the cheater would just forfeit right then and there, shuffling the cards back in their deck before anyone realized they were cheating. This is a little extra funny considering nowadays there's an archetype of monsters that let you just set them in the spell and trap zones via their effect. And finally, there's a fact that has nothing to do with the card game itself, but the anime. The series Yu Gi Oh! of Reigns, the sixth mainline Yu Gi Oh! series, is really hard to watch in its entirety, especially if you prefer dubs like I do. As at least here in the States, the episodes are spread out all over multiple streaming platforms, but you can get the full series on YouTube, which is good, right? Nope, because some of the episodes have had broken audio that doesn't seem to work and youtube i want my fucking money back anyways i had more facts but i gotta get back to the basement as cool kid only pays me in like three minutes of exposure to the sun for like all the art i make for him and my time's almost up if you want to know more Yu-Gi-Oh effects go to dickandnuts.com okay bye okay i'm back normally i do my like and subscribe and all that stuff but i'm not gonna bother with that this time this video is really special to me and was such a fun if admittedly somewhat stressful, opportunity to have a lot of my friends get involved and broadcast their personality and style. So, thank you for watching as always, but also a huge thank you to all of the contributors. Going in order of appearance, thank you to Biff the Bear, Idan, Tapato, Blueprint, Nitro, Phoenix, Red Pixel, Kazette, and Rosie, or Ring Around Me, I, I guess. A lot of these people had other projects or obligations and still found time to get stuff in for the video, so the fact that they did this with no real incentive other than for fun really means a lot to me. Now that the cat is out of the bag, let me know what you guys think of this kind of video. Maybe I'll do it again next year. Also, as a quick new thing, I want to give a huge thank you to all of my channel supporters. So then, a huge thanks to Evan, Eliu, the US Department- fuck you, I'm calling you Z41, I know who you are, Gargatarian, The Goober, Radiant Miru, Soft Napkin, and Lil Tapata- Lil T is that his late- is that like his rap name? <laughs> With all of that said, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you all next year where I overdose on Argazine and end up in hospice.